Hi, Nick. Hello, Warwick. Hello, listeners. <laughs> There's some dead air. I'm sure the team will edit it out and nobody will be any of the wiser. Yeah, no, they'll leave it in and show us up for the amateurs that we really are. Well, that probably wouldn't surprise anybody that listens at all, as a matter of fact. Anyway, have you got some hilarity for us? Nicole? I do, but first I wanted to know, over the break, did you spend any time out in the paddock with your cows? I did. I had to move them around. Oh, that was a nice one. And do you have a bull or do you only have cows? No, no bulls. They go through fences to get to other people's cows. They do. And I had a really good tip for you, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, because you might need this at some point when you are in the paddock with somebody else's bull. How do you stop a bull from charging Warwick? Do you know? No, I do not. You just cancel its credit card. Oh, how did I know that was coming? <laughs> I could say all sorts of things about, you know, bull excrement and stuff, but I, I won't. Please don't. Mm. Keep it clean. Anyway, uh, this is meant to be a new format, and <laughs> new season, new energy, and here we are with the same jokes and my groaning, oh. and uh, I really should learn I, I need to go to acting classes you're letting down the team Warwick. I know. I need to get uh, you all enthusiastic and bubbly with fun chasing a bull around the paddock anyway uh i can't think of a segue for that stop a bull from charging well, maybe, maybe there are, a segue. but there are bull bars on cars oh you're just coming in with all of them i think our guest today is going to do a much better job of the puns nick <laughs> tim cullen from tradie spec welcome to the podcast mate Hi guys, how are we? Very, well, <laughs> very good. How are you going now, Tim? Just right now. I, I'm I'm very well. I'm I'm sitting in an air conditioned office and it's hot outside and uh, I'm I'm enjoying the I'm enjoying the December and the Christmas spirit at the moment. To be to be honest with you. Nice, <laughs> nice. So, uh, Tim, tell our listeners a little bit about Tim the man, not Tim the boss. We'll get to that sure. bit. Yeah, look, um, I I'm a, a pretty pretty easygoing guy to be honest. I, I like simple things, nothing too complicated. I uh, I enjoy uh, relaxing on the weekends with the uh, with the missus. Uh, I enjoy a bit of Netflix. I enjoy a bit of uh, a bit of Stan, and I enjoy uh, going to the gym and going for a run. And then that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Um, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's and it's all steam ahead with the business. So to be fair, me and uh, me as a guy and me as a boss uh, are not too not too separate um, because business is is very much a big part of my life at the moment. So cool, mate. And so your uh, your business is the business of vehicles. We can see one in the background there, mate. So as Coxie said before we hit record, very much on brand. Uh, and it looks like a Ute. It so, is. you know, we're doing the whole cliche tradey thing. If if anybody actually watches these on YouTube, you'll be able to see that. And if you're listening to this and you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, um, head on over. I think uh, we have three subscribers. Um, so far, YouTube <laughs> hasn't approached us to pay us any money for advertising, but we're, you know, we're getting close. Yeah. We're edging uh, closer. Five viewers, and I think that's when the uh, revenue kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> we're not quite at Mr. Beast or whatever it is levels. The, the Beast, Mr. Beast. I think it's Mr. Yeah. Beast, isn't it? Uh, but Tim, help us get some more YouTube subscribers, mate. Tell us a bit more about, um, uh, Tradie Spec, I guess, and how you came to be sitting here. How did you come to be running this business? Yeah, look, it's, um, to be honest with you, it's, it was a little bit of a fluke if, uh, um, if I'm speaking truthfully, my, myself and my business partner, my business partner and I, I should say, were working, um, for a startup, uh, rental business. Roughly five years ago, we're about five years into trading at the moment, and we, my business partner is in sales and I was in finance, and um, we were sort of sitting there constantly watching um, the same ute and van drive past the, 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 on the main road out the front of the business every single day. And obviously, um, you know, what we know about tradies is that the, the vehicle that they drive is, is incredibly important to um, them running a functional business. And what we noticed about the Utes and the Vans was the fact that they had toolboxes and ladder racks and tow bars and roof racks and snorkels and all that kind of additional specs um, on them, which I guess you could say are fit for purpose. The, the vehicles were fit for purpose for their trades. And we noticed that no one was really doing that. 
no one was really offering that type of service, that type of fleet business in the market. Uh, certainly the business we work for wasn't offering that. And my business partner, Dixie, who was in sales and sort of a sales specialist, I guess you could say, was noticing that as we were dropping cars to these tradies, the uh, common response was like, this is just not going to cut the mustard for me, right? The, uh, you know, if it was a, in some occasions, we were dropping a Corolla to the to the uh, to to the tradie, and and you know that that's clearly not fit for purpose. It's not going to do the job for them. So it was a common response, and and within the space of a couple of months, we basically packed up uh, and resigned from our from our jobs and kicked off kicked off this business. And so we went out and bought one car, uh, one Ute. We bought a secondhand. Uh, Toyota Hilux from uh, a dealership in Sydney, which we basically um, begged Macquarie Bank for a loan for, which we had no business being approved for, but we were able to get it across the line. And so next thing within the space of sort of six weeks, we had a, a, you know, no job and, and a ute. And you know, we basically sat down and said, okay, we need to, we need to get this thing on hire. How do we do, how do we go about that? And so we put an ad on Gumtree. Sure enough, after a couple of days, we get a call from someone who's like, I'd like to rent the Ute for seven days. We said, no problem. We'll, um, we'll deliver the car to you. And she said, great, I'm in Richmond, which if you're not from Sydney, Richmond compared to where we are is about a two hour drive uh, Northwest. And if you know anything about rental businesses, if you've got to drive that far, you're about to make no money on the, uh, yeah. on the rent. So, um, we were, you know, I guess learning at this stage. Anyway, we drive the car out to Richmond. We take all the paperwork. Everything was, uh, everything was uh, on paper <laughs> in, in, when we kicked this off. Put the car on hire. We jumped back in um, Dixie's father-in-law's sky blue Hyundai Gets and get back <laughs> to the And we basically sat around for three days because we had no other cars and nothing really else to do. And Next minute, we get a call from the, uh, the the customer who's like, we're finished with the rental. Can you come and pick it up? This was three days later, not seven days, which we were expecting. So we jump in the jump in, in his uh, father-in-law's gets. We drive out to Richmond. We, we go to pick the car up. And basically, the ute had been smoked in, had no fuel, was uh, filthy, had concrete set in the back of the train, had a massive scratch down the driver's side door. And we kind of just... Jumped in the ute, you know, did the sort of the, the handover, jumped in the ute, drove back to the site. And I just remember sitting in the ute the whole time on the way back, just like, what have we done? Mm. We have, uh, we are, we are toast. And next thing, um, yeah, we, we, it was a good learning curve. And, you know, next thing it was two utes and then it was five utes and then it was 50 utes and 100 utes. And now we're sort of sitting at about 500 utes in the fleet. So it's, um, it's been a it's been a great journey, but it's uh, there's been a few hurdles, I guess, is the easiest way to put it. I don't think business is without hurdles. Unfortunately, we've got a lot, often the best lessons are the ones we learn the hard way because they're the ones we prevent ourselves from repeating. Generally, Sorry, I, okay. I'd love to take this back to the need to rent a Ute. So excuse, I'm going to be really vulnerable and be ignorant here and say. As a business owner, I've only ever purchased vehicles. I've had them on lease, perhaps would be another way to look at it. You know, just a structure that the accountant required for the best returns for us, for our tax structure at that time. Why would somebody rent a ute and do they generally do it for a short term or a long term? It's a good question. Um, originally, we we the model was to do short term rental. Um and the U just came fit for purpose with toolbox, ladder racks, tow bar, all, all that, all that, um, all those specs. So the original idea was just short-term rental. And then what we found is we were getting requests from tradies to rent the, the U for a long period of time. And the common thing we were getting is like, I just don't want to buy the U or I'm, I don't want to go through the banks. Uh, my business is a startup and I can't get access to finance anyway, or I don't have the capital to go out and purchase a U outright. Um, I can't, you know, there, there, there was a range of reasons. And so the business kind of morphed, the model kind of morphed from a short-term rental to what we have now, which is a flexi rent, mm -hmm. uh, and a rent to own. Mm -hmm. Flexi rent being particularly good for um, a, a better price point, a more affordable price point on the rental, um, but you get flexibility over a long period of time. So you can kind of like 
have the ute on and off for for for, for months without having a a locked in contract. Mm -hmm. The rent to own was something that came following those requests where the, the customers were renting it for say a year, two years and said, is there an option where I can own this vehicle? And at the time we didn't have anything. And so we came up with a structure that suited what they were in need of, which was flexibility like a rental, but also if they went the full term to be able to own the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question more directly, we didn't think that there was going to be a need for tradies who wanted to rent a vehicle, but um, what we found was is that they were actually finding it far more difficult to get access to funding than we expected to purchase a vehicle. And in fact, when we dived in deep on the research, since 1995 to now, about uh, there, there is about 35% less funding available to businesses than there is in the, the retail space. And, that's for a range of different reasons, but a couple of the, the reasons that we believe uh, are, are probably behind that is the um, uh, risk and regulatory framework that the lenders and banks have shifted away from being relatively uh, open to lending to business, businesses to being far more risk adverse to lending to businesses, particularly in the construction space, which we know can be volatile at times. Um, and also the property market in Sydney and, and across Australia, which has increased significantly. And what most loans, at least 50% of loans in Australia require is property as collateral. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a young tradie between the ages of, you know, 25 and 35, who might have a young family and uh, is starting up a business, it's kind of a chicken and the egg scenario. They need to get a vehicle um, on the road so they can get their business up and running. And if they can't get access to the finance because they don't have a property, then they can't earn money to get into the property market and so on and so forth. And so the cycle continues. Mm. And so that's that's kind of, um, to answer your question in a, in a long form way there, um, we didn't think that traders wanted to rent vehicles. And then we just had this overwhelming demand for, for, for guys who were, who were looking for this type of option. Mm. Incredible to think because I don't know that I would have thought of any of those scenarios because they haven't been my reality. And I think that's the point, right? You need somebody that's looking outside for reality of many rather than just their own personal experience to create a business like this. Um, I wonder, so the one, as you were talking through that scenario that I have found, it was our son. He had um, an accident and his car was, it took like a whole month for them to even come back and say, it's a write-off, we're going to pay you out. And during that time, his insurance paid for a gets or whatever the little high under was. Now, he's a tradie. Yeah. And, of course, you can't carry all your tools in a gets. And where are you going to put the ladder? And what happens if the boss needs you to go and pick up some materials? So is, your, is there a way in which we can specify that we utilize your company in those, in those scenarios with our insurance so that we can mm -hmm. get something fit for purpose? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, one of the uh, – I mean, my business partner and I – our background in the rental game is in the accident replacement. Um, so we do know how to provide those shorter term rentals. It's a smaller portion of our fleet, but most certainly we have customers who call us up who have had an accident, mm -hmm. can't get access to a fit for purpose commercial rental uh, through their insurer or through the market, whatever it may be. And so we provide them a fit for purpose rental whilst their vehicle's off the road. So there's a bit of a range of services that we offer. Um, it's a smaller portion of the fleet, but yeah, definitely we, we offer that as well um, because it's the same issue. We hear it all the time. The, the, the insurer is trying to put me in a Corolla and I, I can't carry a ladder on a Corolla, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. I can barely put my Esky into the boot in a Corolla. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, dear. Um, unless you, of course, you're an apprentice and you turn up with, you know, the old Magna wagon or something and try and fit all the painting gear in the back. That's what you say. Yeah. It's always a painter, isn't it? And a yep. Magna wagon. Painters and plasterers. I had a mate who was a plaster and he had so many young guys turn up with like an old beat up Camry wagon or something. And it's like, yeah. mate, how are you going to fit all of your gear in there? It's like, oh, I figured it out. <laughs> out the front window, a bit of gaffer tape. There was a time where the Magna wagon was the number one car in Australia, I believe. I believe it was <laughs> right. the year. Yeah, it's probably about 1994, but anyway. <laughs> um, Tim, I've got a question that, look, you may or may not be able to answer in general terms. And, and uh, you know, we have a lot of people in sort of the, I guess you're in a quasi finance space in terms of giving advice to people around money. It always freaks people out a bit. Uh, but we get asked the question quite a bit 
and, and have done over the years from trade business owners. Let's say they've got the cash or most of the cash sitting in the business where they could go buy a vehicle. And quite often they'll say, well, I could pay for it or I could finance it. Or I guess in your case, I could rent the thing. Is there like, how do they make that decision? Cause they're like, well, should I buy it or, or rent it or finance it? You know, which one's better? Obviously there's different tax benefits, but then there's different impacts on cash flow. What's your, your view on that? Yeah, look, it's it's a different, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult question to sometimes answer because I guess it all comes down to the, the business's circumstances and the trading circumstances. But mm-hmm. I mean, for for such a long time, interest rates have been so low that you might as well have financed the vehicle and amortised mm-hmm. the cost over a four or five year period, right? Mm-hmm. One of the things we know about commercial vehicles in Australia is that they hold their value far better than passenger vehicles. So. Mm-hmm. If you go out and buy a Hilux, it's say $40,000 or $45,000. It's only going to depreciate at 13% per year versus 17 to 20% per year for a passenger vehicle. So mm-hmm. you can be relatively sure of the residual value of the vehicle at the end of the life, right? And that's one of the things that we model our business off is that we know with relative confidence what the residual value of our fleet is going to be. So we always finance vehicles and we take on that risk on behalf of the trading to be able to provide them a, a rental. So it comes down to, I guess, the individual circumstances. Your larger, more established trade businesses who have access to large amounts of capital are probably going to purchase their vehicles outright because uh, it's the cheapest way to do it, right? It's 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 the So long as they can manage the fleet themselves as well or add on a fleet service pack through a, a, an FMO, um, then, um, you know, that, that is typically the cheapest way to do it. But your smaller um, to medium-sized trade businesses may not necessarily always have access to that amount of capital. Or if they do, do they want to allocate that to a fleet? Would they prefer to distribute that amongst new staff members or distribute it amongst a marketing campaign? Or uh, do they want to... Um, you know, I guess you name it, upgrade the tools or, or whatever it is. And it, so it comes down to sort of the individual circumstances and purchasing a fleet outright is not the wrong way to go, but if it can be allocated to a portion of your business that's going to generate more income for a smaller to medium size trade, size trade business, that's probably the better allocation of that capital than to purchase that those vehicles outright. Um, now, the next question is, is, are those vehicles going to be utilised 100% of the time? Um, you know, we know that uh, if a smaller trade business who accesses apprentices might have a higher turnover of staff in that area, then is the vehicles that you've purchased outright going to collect dust for 20% of that year? Um, over five years, that's 20% of your year over five years. That's a whole year worth of um, uh, unutilised vehicle that when you equate to dollar figures is quite costly as well. So again, it comes down to sort of those individual circumstances. And what we are seeing is that traders are looking for a little, little, little bit more flexibility in their own fleet. Yep. Um, so that's probably the best way I can put it. It's, it, you know, a lot of our guys, they'll chat with their accountant and just work out what's the, you know, where are we sitting financially is, is purchasing the vehicle the best decision at the moment. The other thing that's just a side note here, I mean, the, the, the instant asset write-off uh, limit has just dropped from 150000 down to, to 20000 So there's not the access to that uh, tax uh, incentive um, as there used to be as well. So that's another thing that they've got to consider. No, one, no one's able to write off a Land Cruiser ute anymore. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> It's just problematic for us as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just yeah. got to buy Getzes and write them off instead. <laughs> Not literally. <laughs> nice. No, that's a good answer because it, it is obviously dependent, you know, it's like how long is a piece of string answer. But a lot of people, um, there's just so many different opinions around. And yeah, like you say, they talk to their accountant and they're looking at it from often from a tax point of view. Uh, and then, you know, so our clients chat to us, of course. Uh, but a lot of tradies out there are just like, well, I don't know which one to do, you know, is the interest rates is still worth it at, at, you know, 10, 14% or should I be just buying it outright? And obviously it depends on the the circumstances, but I think that's kind of the point is 
you need to think more broadly than just saving tax. You know, it's not just about writing the asset off um, or claiming the interest on your on your tax. So sure. thank you for almost clearing that one up, Tim. Almost got there. <laughs> Um, mate, I've I got another question that um, you obviously see a lot of trade businesses and because of, uh, and obviously you're not going to disclose specifics, but you guys would see applications and, and, you know, financial performance and business management insights into a lot of trade businesses. I wonder if you could give us your kind of summary of what the best businesses are doing and perhaps what the 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 struggle street trade businesses are doing or not doing give us sort of that contrast if you could sure yeah um so we've 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 had about two and a half thousand trade businesses go through our um our business that that we've supplied a vehicle to in some way shape or form over the last five years and so we've seen we've seen a range of different trade business types um, from large to small. Our largest customer is a publicly listed construction company um, who have the who have a large fleet through us. And our smallest customers are, are your local sole traders. Um, and, and there's a broad spectrum of approaches, but I guess from my perspective, the fundamentals of the business um, don't vary that much for, from a good businesses and great businesses to um, uh, the fundamental principles that um, uh, I guess, not so good businesses have and what's the difference between those? And I think what we've seen with your better performing trade businesses is a focus and care of attention to detail on the little things. Um, and that, I guess, has developed over time through the consistency and discipline of the approach to the business, right? Do they understand what their, uh, what their uh, point of differentiation is? What are they offering the customers that no one else in the market is offering? Are they specialists in that area? Do they provide it better than anyone else who is close to what they're doing? Do they service their customers in the best way that they possibly can? Um, the, do they nurture their CRM? Do they nurture their customer base? Are they following up with those customers even when they're not doing any work for them? Uh, and how many times do they follow them up with them over the course of a year? We know that it's far cheaper to do business with a existing customer that is to try and acquire a new customer all the time. So if you're providing poor quality service and constantly having to find new customers, well, mathematics will tell you over time, you're going to run out of customers eventually. Um, so nurturing the customer base, attention to detail, the consistency and discipline of um, doing the little things every single day over a long period of time. Um, there's no better um, measure of success than um uh, consistency and discipline it's one of the constants that i believe exist through all successful people whether it be in business or whether you're an athlete or whatever it is it's it's that 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 the the boring and unremarkable i guess is probably the the best way to put it you know it's the um you know do they have a solid staff base that just continually repeat the process over and over again are they across the little things in the business, the detail? Do they understand, you know, are they making money? Is there profitability in the business? Um, if you were to ask them what their margin is, do they know the answer to that? Um, and are they confident in that as well? Um, and then I guess who's in and around it? Do they have a good support structure of that business? Do they have a mentor? Do they have um, someone that they can lean on for advice every so often um, or weekly or whatever it is? Do they have a good accountant? Um, so I think that's probably probably the three core things is, is nurturing the CRM and the customers, um, understanding the point of differentiation and attention to detail, the consistency and discipline in the business, and then understanding the financial mechanics or paying attention to the financial mechanics regularly enough um, to, um, I think that's what we see is, as being the difference between really good operators, really good tradies and, and trade business owners, and the ones that, um, aren't performing so well. Mm. Mm. It's a good wrap up, mate. Thank I you. feel like Tim could nearly jump into our chair at this. I was just going to say, good thing we're recording this. We're going to get the team to transcribe that later and start business coaching. <laughs> this is a radio. Let's be honest, you guys. <laughs> Tim, I think there's a lot of um, you don't know what you don't know. And so I wondered around the, because you clearly as work and you have just unpacked, you're seeing two different types of tradie business owners. Some are doing really well and some are still a bit on struggle street. What do you think the key difference is 
in terms of, you know, we've spoken about discipline, et cetera, but if we don't know that that's what's required to run a good trade business, um, we don't know. So there's got to be another key difference there that that makes that shift for somebody so that they're able to adopt those three things that you've just spoken about. Yeah, certainly I think uh, a, uh, a structure that uh, has a vision and some goals. Mm. Um, is there a clear pathway or is there not a clear pathway? Um, because, yeah, as you say, it's hard to identify whether there's consistency and discipline if they don't actually know where we're trying to get to or we know where we're trying to go. And so if we were to sit down, I mean, we do it in our business, no doubt you guys do it in your business and um, the good operators do it in, 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 well, the difference between the good operators and the, uh, the poorly performing ones is, is there a set of goals and principles and values that guide the business towards the future? And um, is that clear? Is that, is that vision clear? Is it communicated to, to, the, to the, the team that they have mm. in their business? So um, you're exactly right. If you can't, it's hard to identify whether there's consistency and discipline if there's no goal because mm. you know, what, are, what are we working towards every month and every quarter and every year? Um, but what I guess a question to throw back to you guys, what do you guys see as being the, the key differential uh, between the good operators and the, and the not so good operators? It's a great question, Tim. And I think you probably get two very different answers from Warwick and I, I think um, for me, it's vulnerability. It's, it's being prepared to be vulnerable. It's not an indus- industry that uh, fosters vulnerability. And yet what we see pretty consistently, even thinking about our own client base, is those who are able to put their hand up and say, look, I don't know, or I need help, or this isn't working, or talk to their community. It doesn't need to be with us. It can be with the rest of their support team, like their accountant, et cetera. They're the ones that tend to find that information early on so that they can then adopt the discipline that's required to create that outcome. Um, I also agree around the goal planning. I do not think we have had a single client, and I'm really flipping through the files in my head here, that has been able to really well uh, articulate their goals in the first couple of sessions or the first couple of meetings we've had with them because they're generally blindingly working through the mess that is often a trade business. Um, So I think it's, it's, it is a combination of the two. And for me, it really takes that vulnerability to put their hand up and say, I don't know what I'm doing or I need some help to start with. Hmm. But I reckon Mari will probably have a totally different answer. Uh, Look, it's probably because it's where I started my tertiary education and career Um, but also because I've just seen it as such a critical aspect is, uh, financial mastery and, and maths, Mm. you know, the, I worked with a mentor years ago and coaching is full of cheesy cliches and analogies and all sorts Mm. of sayings and stuff. And I guess part of the, the disappointment for me in that is a lot of people dismiss some of those things. Because like, oh yeah, I heard all that before. And the reality is they become cliche because they're actually true. Mm. And one of my mentors in the financial space years ago, many years ago, always talked about uh, being able to play cricket. He was a, he's an American, so he didn't understand cricket at all. Um, and he talked about the fact that there's this language that allows you to play the game. And so in cricket, you know, we have all these field positions like silly mid off and, you know, you bowl a, a, a leg break or something. And if you don't know the language, you can't play the game. It's well, it's really difficult to play the game well. And every sport has their own lingo. And he went on to say business has its own language and the language of business is numbers. Yeah. Now there's also marketing obviously, and there's systems and all those other aspects, but ultimately the scoreboard for every business it, it comes down to numbers. Uh, you know, you just said before, Tim and uh, Nick and I, I think both grinned wryly uh, at at your comment about, you know, knowing your margins um, uh, as what sets apart a good business from a struggling business. Yeah. And so margins are part of that scoreboard of business. And I think for me, it's not the only thing. It's certainly one of the critical things that if if someone struggles to understand the fundamental numbers in their business, then I just think they're going to struggle to get results, mm. no matter how positive and and how good their marketing or anything else is. They're just going to be paying people to do work for them because they're not going to be making a profit. Sure. Yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more. And and 
understanding how to how to break down the numbers and and how often to measure them you know like what's the what's the report i mean it's it's not necessary to have like crazy reporting functions no. in your business, but basic reporting functions that work down from your operating uh your main operational drivers through to your finance main operation uh, financial drivers through to all the way down to how much cash is left over in the end of in your bank account right mm. how much cash is generated in your bank account at the end of the month um, and if that number is below the targeted benchmark, then mm. uh, okay, there's something wrong. What 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 needs to be done? Um, I remember I, I, not you know talking about cliches, um, Warwick. It's it's funny because you're you're so right. Cliches are, are, are cliches for a reason because they're true. And there's a book called um, uh, Jim Collins' Good to Great. I don't know if you guys have read read the book. But it's mm-hmm. obviously a timeless, timeless classic, and um, there's so much, there's so much, um, you know. Excuse my French, but bullshit on on uh, on Instagram and online about businesses and <laughs> successful people and all that kind of stuff. But the the, <laughs> the the good value is in those old timeless classics of, that 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 teach good business principles, um, mm. and and in that book. Jim Collins, good to great. One of the things that stood out to me is like, don't bury your, uh, don't um, efface the brutal facts of reality. When things are not good, don't bury your head in the sand. Face it head on and work out what to do off the back of it. And mm. I do wonder whether that's one of the key principles of good and great businesses is that they they face those challenges head on rather than avoiding them. Mm. I think when you relate that back to numbers, we hear all the time, but I'm not good at numbers and I don't understand. And and when you look at what they're doing in their businesses day in, day out, in every trade, they are using math all of the time and complex math, not simple math, complex math. So they're far better than they give themselves credit for, but because they believe their own story that they're telling themselves, they get stuck in that space. And Mm -hmm. we've got people we've been working years and years and years with and they still have such fear and they still believe their story so firmly making that switch for them is still really difficult for them to, to flick the light bulb and actually fill in a, something as simple as a dashboard that requires like 10 numbers that are very simple for anybody to find, to give them, we've done the hard work or worked it and put the spreadsheet together so that it spits back all of the information they need in little pretty pictures. So it's really easy to understand. And in actual fact, they could do all of that because they have the skill set already. They just don't believe it about themselves. And I think that's mm. that's where to take back to where I come from, that that vulnerability to be able to put up my hand and say, I don't know, can give them the confidence to move into a position where they can obtain that mastery because nobody woke up and had the financial mastery that we require to run a good business. At some point we needed to either learn it or admit that we didn't understand it for somebody to teach us. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I think it, it's all, it's a bit chicken and the egg, like you were talking about earlier, Tim. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But le- learn, learning, learning, I guess business is a process of continual improvement. And so learning is such a fundamental, such an important uh, uh, principle. And I, I think to your point there, I think that sometimes people feel that, um, if I, if it, if that's not my specialty or, or that's not my talent, um, uh, it can't be learned. And, and and some of the principles are, I guess, viewed as like characteristics of a personality rather than a skill that can be honed or or developed. Mm. Like consistency, like discipline, like these sort of like uh, I guess virtues, or sometimes touted as virtues, are actually skills that can be learned and developed over time. Mm. And in fact, our only skills and develop. Uh, the, the skills that are developed over time. They're, they're not inherent to anyone in particular. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the whole concept of, of uh, talent versus acquired skills is an interesting one, and I've read some great books on it over the years. Uh, and I think I think it just becomes a convenient story that we can tell ourselves is that um, oh, I just wasn't cut out for business like it's some sort of thing we're born with or not born with and you either got it or you didn't. And if you didn't get it, well, you might as well not try. Yeah. And, and it is such a crock. 
Yes. Uh, like just about anything in life. I mean, I was probably never going to be a star player in the NBA because I'm five foot seven and a squeak. Uh, and so, you know, I'm just not going to be able to compete against some seven foot monster yeah. uh, at that level. Mm. And that's not the level any of us need to play at in life to actually live a good life. None of us have to be, you know, those outliers. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a great book about it called Outliers. And unfortunately, we all look at those outliers. We look at the the trade business on Instagram that looks like they're absolutely crushing it and they've only been around for nine minutes mm -hmm. and they have 50,000 Instagram followers. But oftentimes we don't see behind the facade. We don't see the full story, you know, even a business like yours, Tim, you know, we could sit here and look at you. It's like 500 vehicles. Like that is a big number. There's a lot of zeros on the end of that number in terms of exposure and capital and, and everything else. Um, and None of us really see the full story behind that, how you guys have come to be at that point, the hard work you've done, the stuff you've had to learn. And so unfortunately, I think people do the usual thing. They discount the the hard work in favor of the easy story that, oh, well, that's just not me. Or, you know, you got to be big, otherwise you just can't make it. Or there's this weird black hole in between, you know, your first 500,000 and your first 2 million or whatever. Oh, they're, just, they're just all crap stories that become excuses. I think I'm on a bit of a rant here. Sorry. I've taken over the podcast. I wasn't going <laughs> to point it out, but anyway, <laughs> can we go back to goals? Yes, yes please. Goals. All right. I'll save you yet again. <laughs> um, goals for you guys over the next five years, reference that you guys do goal planning. I think it'd be fantastic for our listeners to understand what you and your partner, your business partner plan to do with Tradespec. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we've just opened up Melbourne, our Melbourne site. And so uh, we're in the process of setting that up and getting some vehicles down there so that we can start servicing uh, Melbourne. And then next in line, hopefully, is Brisbane to be able to offer the service up in Brisbane as well. And um, we, we've, got, we've got a few hundred cars on order that are due in, in the back half of this financial year. So um, you know, there's, there, the expectation is that we'll, we'll um, you know, we'll land, you know, a few hundred cars higher than where we are currently, which is, which is exciting, but obviously a lot of work in store for us over the next six months. Mm. From there, the goal is to, to be able to offer this service to tradies nationwide. Um, our mission uh, is to ensure all tradies in Australia have access to a reliable and suitable fit for purpose vehicle. And our vision for the for the future is driving trade business to build a better future. So a little bit of a fitting conversation, I guess, that we're having at the moment. But um, you know, we we we've always felt that tradies are, you know, very good at doing the 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 you know being a plumber. They've got the tools to be a plumber or be a be an electrician or um, a concreter or a roofer, and 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 sometimes don't necessarily have the tools to do the business. Mm. And, so, you know, we, we've wanted to, um, you know, I guess position ourselves as, as well as we can to, to try and help trade businesses build a better future for themselves. And we, we wholeheartedly believe that the, the Australia, because it's such a huge sector of, of the economy, that Australia will be a better, the, the standards of the, the economy and the quality of life that we all enjoy will only improve if there's, stronger, better, more competitive trade businesses in the industry develops and gets better over time. Um, you know, I, I, I challenge anyone to tell me that they don't know a tradie or several of them at some, you know, in some part of their life, whether it be family members, whether it be friends. Um, and, and so I think, you know, it's easy to forget how much of an impact tradies have on our, on our lives, but you know the, the lights come on and the the we're warm and, and in winter and cool in summer and um, you know we, we have water flowing through our pipes and the infrastructure that we enjoy in Australia is all built by by tradies. So you know we want to we want to be able to contribute our portion of our um, or, or can, as tradies spec we want to be able to contribute as much as we can to that to ensure that you know tradies are always on the road and and um, they're in reliable and suitable vehicles and. Um, and that we can offer it across Australia. So that that's sort of where we're trying to take it um, over the next few years. And, and so we're, we're investing as much of our capital into it at, at the moment to, to keep driving it forward. And 
um, you know, it's a challenging 12 months ahead. No, no doubt um, you guys are having some of those conversations with your customers that the next 12 months is going to be hard and people are going to feel the pain. And, um, you know, and, and, and it, it's about, I guess, you know, the, the, the businesses that can get through this next 12 months, particularly who got through COVID as well, um, will be incredibly battle hardened when they come out the other side. So, um, you know, the goal is to is to is to push through the, the difficult periods. It's a challenge, but businesses face challenges all the time, and, and it's about just pushing through and getting to the other side. So, that's that's sort of what's in store for us over the next over the next uh, well few years, I guess is is the is the that timeline and. Yeah, we're excited about it. We're pumped about it. We've we've got more staff coming on board, and they're they're pumped about it. And we like getting everyone involved in in that vision and, and the mission. And um, yeah, I think it's an exciting time for everyone in business, particularly tradies. Uh, so long. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about how many puns I, know. I was counting That's- there, Tim. <laughs> You cannot avoid them in this game, yeah. mate. Driving yeah. and building and yeah. the road to the future. It's just so good. Just it's dripping. Pun is dripping bad. from the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, uh, it's been a great chat today, mate. It's always nice to talk to a business who is serving the trade industries that has great insights. And I think with the number of customers, you, you dropped the figure of 2,500 trade businesses that you guys have worked with over the last five years. I think that gives you an amazing insight. So um, for those of you listening to this podcast, there's some fantastic, uh, I don't know, not not sort of inside running, but there's some fantastic key points out of this episode that I'd love you to even go back and have a second listen to um, because as Tim's talking about with the future, the next year or two uh, will be some continued learnings and opportunities for growth and uh, building strength amongst those of you who are still going. Um, so mate, um, thanks for your time today. If, uh, anyone's thinking about a vehicle, you know, uh, instead of buying a $150,000 clapped out Land Cruiser Ute, uh, maybe renting a Getz or something, uh, where would they find out about you guys? Uh, so you can go to our website, which is tradiespec.com.au, or you can shoot us a message on Instagram, which is just tradiespec or Facebook, which is tradiespec also. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we've got we've got more vehicles coming in shortly. So there's plenty of ranges and Hiluxes that uh, will be ready to go fit, fit out, ready to go for whoever's looking for them. So, yeah. Nice. Well, thanks. mate, thanks again for your time. Thank you, guys. Very much appreciated.